It's a sort of a form of self-delusion. Because we say we're the most intelligent creatures on the planet. Ecologically speaking, we're not that intelligent. I was debating a Norwegian whaler one time, and he said, but Watson, you say that whales are more intelligent than people. This is, this is stupid. How could you say something so stupid? I said, George, I measure intelligence by the ability to live in harmony with the natural world, and by that criteria, we're far more intelligent. The, the whales are far more intelligent than we are. He said, well, by that criteria, cockroaches are more intelligent than we are. I said, George, you're beginning to understand what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and that, that is the truth. I mean, we measure our intelligence by the ability to manipulate tools. If a blob of protoplasm stepped out of a spaceship, it must be intelligent. It's got technology. We wouldn't even question it. But what do you do when you're dealing with species that are so perfectly adapted to their environment they don't need tools. Whales don't need to drive around a car. They don't need telephones. They communicate over vast distances. They actually can send uh, images to each other like that through communications. They don't need television. But we just happen to believe that everything has to live on our level to, to be intelligent. If anybody's ever taken Biology 101, there's always this thing where they put, here's the rat brain. Then we have the dog brain, the chimp brain, and the human brain. You can see that the size of the brain gets increasingly larger as you move from the rat to the human. You can see that the convolutions on the neocortex become more pronounced as we move up towards the human. You know what they never do? They never put a dolphin, orca, or sperm whale brain up there. It makes us look really stupid. <laughs> and we don't like looking stupid, so we just <clears throat> censor it. The fact is, is the human brain is 1,300 cubic centimeters. The orca? is a 6,000 cubic centimeter brain. The sperm whale is a 9,000 cubic centimeter brain, the largest brain to have ever evolved on the planet. And all mammals, from mice to people, have three lobe brains, with the exception of cetaceans. Four lobe brains, the most complex brain that's ever developed, that's, devolved, that's evolved over 45 million years. But we think that they're stupid because, well, here's the other interesting thing. Dolphins have learned English words and their meanings. We have not learned one word of dolphin. <laughs> so they know what we're up to. We don't know what they're doing. <laughs> One of the interesting things about orcas, and I, I learned this, I uh, hope I'm not going on too long here. <laughs> but years ago, we put a, I jumped into the water with two other people in the Bella Bella Straits in the path of an oncoming pod of orcas. This was 1975 when everybody believed that orcas ate people. And uh, so we wanted to prove that that wasn't true, and we were feeling pretty gung-ho about it. We jumped in, and suddenly I can tell you your perspective on an orca in 1975 changes considerably when just your head's out of the water looking at them coming at you. <laughs> and as they approached, uh, they suddenly disappeared. Now, the only thing more daunting than an oncoming pot of orcas is an oncoming pot of orcas that disappears. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's when we started thinking, well, let me see, these are transients, and they eat sea lions. And they're bigger than we are. <laughs> so we were starting to get really, well, maybe this wasn't a good idea. <laughs> and suddenly they just surfaced right beside us. They were right there. And for some strange, ungodly reason, I reached up and grabbed the dorsal fin and phew, I rode a whale. For 200 meters, I rode with this whale holding onto the dorsal fin. Now, you don't go up to a lion in Africa and pet it on the head. But this is the most powerful, most formidable predator in the world. Let me ride alongside. And no orca has ever attacked a human being. I don't think it's because they like us. They just realize, you know, I better not mess with these people. They're like a, a species of serial killers. We don't want anything to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think it's a peaceful coexistence. I don't know. But uh, all I do know is that uh, that experience really went a long ways in, in gaining my respect for, for, for their kind. And over the years, I've found so many different species that I have to admit that and all the time I spent in Africa that I've been at swimming with sharks that I've done and that I've never felt afraid of any other animal. The only time I've ever felt any fear is walking in certain streets of certain cities and and uh, having to be concerned about my own species. Never been concerned about sharks or killer whales or lions or anything else. Um, so I think there's a lot that we, we can learn from them. And unfortunately we're wiping them out. And just finally I'll finish off with this one thing is that Richard Leakey wrote a book called The Sixth Extinction. And in that book, he said that we're now living in the midst of the sixth major extinction in the history of the planet Earth. It's even got a name. It's called the Homocene. And between 2000 and 2065, we will lose more species of plants and animals than we've lost in the last 65.2 million years. It's an incredible catastrophe. 
but you don't read about it in the newspapers and nobody talks about it. Uh, and it's happening right around us right now. And what the problem is here is that one of the species that's going to go extinct will be our own. It's if I went into my engine room of my ship and I saw my engineers popping rivets out of the out of the hull. I said, what are you guys doing? Well, you know, we get back to port, we get a buck a piece for these things. So, <laughs> oh, well, count me in for some of that, you know. I'm all in for that. And then they just keep popping rivets. Well, they're going to pull one rivet too many and the hull, hull's going to collapse and the ship's going to sink. If you look at every species on the planet as a rivet in the hull of the biosphere, we're going to pop one rivet too many and the biosphere is going to collapse and the ship's going to be in trouble. So the problem is, is that all of our world leaders, presidents and prime ministers, are rivet poppers, or they're funded by rivet poppers, or they're dictatorial rivet poppers, but they're all interested in popping rivets. They're not interested in protecting the ship, and they are captains and heads of states, and that should be their ultimate responsibility, is to protect the spaceship Earth that they are part of. But it's, we've, unfortunately, it's an abstraction to most of them, and they can't seem to get beyond that. Everybody's saying, well, it's the economy. The economy is our number one concern. Well, I can tell you right now, without any ecology, there is no economy. You know, And unless we take care of this planet, the economy isn't going to be worth much because there won't be anything really left to worry about. So that's what we're trying to get people to really think about, is the fact that uh, in order to have a healthy planet, we have to have a healthy ecosystem to sustain it. But unfortunately, thanks to the modern media, environmentalism and everything is considered to be out of out of uh, vogue you know so every 20 years or so we get excited about it and then it goes on to something else and it's almost become almost uh, in many people's cases it's almost become sort of a matter of pride oh, I'm not environmentalist I'm not one of those tree huggers you know one of those whale people you know I'm, I'm a responsible person you know I'm I'm worried about the price of fuel and, you know and food and things like that but the fact is they forget that without a, a healthy ecosystem there won't be any of that and trying to get those connections together is probably the main, the main uh, priority concern of any conservationist. Because to be a conservationist, you can't look at what the world's going to look like in four years, like any politician, or eight years. You have to look at what is this world going to be like a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, one million years from now, because everything we do in this generation right now will determine what kind of planet this will be a hundred thousand years from now. And that's our responsibility to our children's children's children. Sea Shepherd is in alliance with the uh, Mohawks, the uh, Iroquois. We're the only two ships in the world that fly the flag of the Five Nations. They gave us that flag and uh, the registration, although it's not recognized, we have to fly the Dutch flag also, but we fly both flags. And the reason for that, when we attended, uh, I attended the uh, invitation of the Mohawks to receive this flag, they told me, they said, look, we have to get this message across that every decision you make has to take into account the consequences of the decision on all future generations. And if we all lived our life that way, then everything, you know, everything would be fine because we would understand that the consequences to our children's 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 children. And if we love our children, then the answer is simple. We save the planet for them and for their children. And that's what it's all about. Thank you. you have to understand about a winemaker is they get really proud of certain things. We do these really nice etched bottles every year. We do a few oh. totems and stuff like that. So we have something for Paul and we thought you'd all share in our little oh. yeah, this is Mike's, uh, some of Mike's wine, the winemaker. So this is a, a... Two words. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>